All right, dear Rabbi Singer, Zechariah 9, 9 states that the Messiah will come. This is our hot topic question, by the way. Uh, it says that the Messiah will be riding, or will come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. The rabbis understood this verse as a messianic passage. The Gospels record that Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. How do you interpret Zechariah's prophecy if it is not speaking about Jesus? As it turns out, Mark, Luke, and John record Jesus coming in on a donkey into Jerusalem. Uh, Matthew misconstrues the passage. And Matthew, sometimes you should leave things alone, but Matthew seeks to correct Mark, because there's no doubt, given that Matthew is copying almost the entire book of Mark verbatim, he has Jesus doing something very striking. Let's look at the text in question, and let's see what the passage says. It's Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, and almost any studied Christian is very familiar with this. Gili ma'oid basion, rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Hari bas Yushalayim, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Why? Hine malkech yavailach, your king is coming to you. Tell us a little bit about this king. Two things. Tzadik, he is just. V'noishahu, v'noishahu really means that he is saved, which is very striking. It's often translated as victorious, but it's really a bad translation. It really means he is saved. Not that he saves, but he is saved. It's a nifal. What does it mean he is saved? Because it is talking about Mashiach. In that he is saved from the armies of the enemies of God, namely Gog and Magog. And then it continues, Oni. Oni really means poor or humble. And he's coming humbly, riding on a donkey, called the foal of a donkey. What happens is Matthew reads this, and Matthew's knowledge of Hebrew was, to put it mildly, very limited. Matthew looks at this text and goes, it sounds like a donkey, the cult, the foal of a donkey. It doesn't sound like one, it sounds like two animals. So if you read Matthew chapter 21, verse 1 through 7, you won't believe it unless you look it up yourself. You will see that when Jesus orders his followers to go and procure for him an animal, it's not one animal, but he actually has him come in on two animals. So he says, go get for me a donkey that's tied and a colt with her. Loosen them and bring them to me. He's doing a circus act where Jesus is actually straddling two animals. And the reason for this is that Matthew misapprehends, misunderstands the Hebrew. Now the Hebrew here is fairly simple. The author Zechariah is using a common poetic structure in Tanakh, which is called a synonymous parallelism, where the second line is then repeated in a third line, but it's reworded. But Matthew doesn't get that. And this is very common in Tanakh. So Matthew, unlike Mark chapter 11, unlike Luke chapter 19 and John 12, in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus is actually coming in on two animals. So he gets it wrong completely. Now, it goes without saying that throughout history, millions of people rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. That doesn't mean I'm the Mashiach. If I would go and get a donkey now and ride down and ride into Yerushalayim, did I become the Mashiach? So the, the point is the very next verse to explain to us what is going on here. What does this mean? Just riding into Jerusalem on a donkey doesn't make you the Messiah. What is happening here? So I said a moment earlier that almost all Christians are familiar with Zechariah 9.9. It's very, very famous. How do I say this? What most Christians don't do is they don't read Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10. The very next passage begins with the words, V'hichrati rechev me'ephraim, and I will cut off the chariots from Ephraim, v'sus me'yerushalayim, and the horses from Jerusalem, v'nechosa keshes milchama, and the bow of war will be taken away, it will be cut off, it will be removed. 
And what will happen? V'dibe shalom lagoyim, and he will speak peace to the nations. Umoshloi miyom v'yad yom uminor ad avse aris, and his a reign, his authority, his rule will be from the river to the end of the world. So what is vital is Zechariah nine nine continues into verse ten. And people don't read this. And most very important is that verse 10 begins with the word and. The and. Which means it's a continuation. Which means that the verse break between Zechariah 9.9 and 9.10 is artificial. It should be read as one continuous passage. And I say, please read it for yourself. Now, why doesn't the Christian Bible quote Zechariah 9 verse 10? Because that's the rub. That's the whole point. The point of Mashiach coming to Shlaim and a donkey is not to tell us, oh, the Messiah is going to come in on a, in a Volvo. He's going to come in on a Honda. What does it make a difference? What animal? Now, we're going to see in a moment why it's important. But why is it important he's coming in on a donkey? Who cares when he comes in? What if he comes in on a giraffe? Why did he come in? What difference does he make? What does it make? How he comes in? So he comes in and he is driving a Lexus. What difference does it make? Well, it is important, but we're going to find out in a moment why. Now, the reason why Christians are not familiar with Zechariah 9 verse 10, and I assure you they're not, is because the Christian Bible won't quote it. The Christian Bible won't quote it because Jesus didn't do it. Anybody can ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Anybody could do that. What you can't do is what, what Jesus didn't accomplish and has not been done is what it says in verse 10. In verse 10, we are told that the, the implements of war, namely horses and chariots, will be cut off, will be removed, and what will the Mashiach do? Not resurrecting the dead, not healing lepers and all this kind of th- all these kinds of things, but he will speak peace to the nations. And Akash Baruch is going to give him sovereignty from one end of the world to the other end of the world, which means all the nations will recognize that the Mashiach is the one who has been given sovereignty from Akash Baruch Hu, and he is the fulfillment of the promises made to King David. But of course, you can say that Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey. You have no idea if he did it then. Presumably, that's maybe how people came in. Came in a donkey, came in a horse. What's the difference? The key is the second part. And the second part is what no one's done. Did he bring peace to the world? The answer is no. I would posit to you, has there ever been a nation that's been more warlike than the followers of Jesus and Christianity, than Christendom? How many millions that they slaughter? I'm not, if you're a Christian, please don't be insulted. But normal Christians are, are embarrassed by the history of the church. Clearly, Christianity, Christendom, did not bring peace to the world. In fact, the, following the, the advent of Christianity, the world became in greater upheaval. There was more destruction. There was more upheaval. The Jewish people were exiled from land. The base of was destroyed. And so on, v'chula, v'chula, and Christianity became the... Would, would rise up after uh, Constantine's conversion to Christianity, and by the end of the 4th century, already half of the empire was already Christian. So, in answer to the question, is very simple. The prophecy of Zechariah 9, 9, and 10 is that there will be peace in the world. That's the point of it. And that helps us understand a donkey. What does it mean that the Mashiach will come in a donkey? Why does Tanakh go out of its way to point this out? Tanakh is so cheap with words, meaning there's so little, there's such scant information in Tanakh. Tanakh will skip, the Hebrew scriptures will skip decades of history. It's not interested until it comes to this very interesting point. And when it does, when it zooms in, pay careful attention. There's a reason why Mashiach is coming in on donkey. Because what does a donkey represent? It represents an animal of labor, not an animal for fast riding as is used in word. No one uses donkeys to go and... F- Imagine someone goes on a donkey and is going to fight the enemy on a donkey. They don't do that. Why? Because a donkey can't run like a horse. But a duck, a horse could run fast. A horse is so powerful. A horse could run like lightning and... and you is used in war in order to defeat the enemy in a quick moment. And the horse represents war, but the donkey represents labor, represents peace. A donkey is an an animal that's a much tougher animal than a horse. A horse is fast and it's speedy and it's beautiful and it's 
Oh, look at this thing. Really a gorgeous animal. Look at a horse. You look at a, if you ever see a, a beautiful, a horse, really, it's a very striking animal. You stare at it and go, look how beautiful this animal. It is quite a, a very striking animal. But a horse really needs, if you're familiar with horses, as I am, I grew up in Brooklyn, I had to be. I'm kidding. But horses require an enormous amount of care. You can't leave a horse out in the rain. You have to bring a horse inside. It can become frightened and so on. Horses are not the smartest animals, and they're not, they require a special kind of feed. They can you know, they could pretty much eat anything. So the key is that, in the, for example, in third world countries, countries that people don't have a lot of money, you'll see it. You'll see that a donkey is pulling... Uh, is pulling the load, is the beast of labor, not a beast of war. And that's the point. How do you know that my exegesis, what I'm telling you, is accurate? How could you be sure that Tanakh, the prophet, Zechariah Hanovi HaKadosh Vator, he meant that? How do you know that what I'm saying is correct? Because it says it. Take a look at Zechariah 9, verse 9. He's coming in on a donkey. Take a look at Zechariah 9, verse 10. God is going to remove the chariots of Ephraim and the horses from Yerushalayim. What are these horses? The Nechosa Keshes Milchama. And I'll remove the bow of war. That's what horse, so horses represent the animals of war because of their power and their speed. When police come in and they're good crowd control, they don't do crowd control with donkeys. They do them with, with horses. V'dibar shalom la'goyim, and he will speak peace to the nations. And his authority, we've went into the world, the other world, which of course didn't happen in the time of Jesus, and there was no peace in the time of Jesus. So therefore, the writers of the Christian Bible could claim that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. What are you going to look up? You're going to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles of Jerusalem in the first century and look up if he, in fact, had a license to ride the donkey in Jerusalem? How silly. That's, that, there's no way to verify that. And if he did, how many millions of people were on Jerusalem on donkey? So that doesn't, that's not the point of the passage. The point is the very next verse. Why a donkey? Because the chariots which horses pull will be cut off. War will come to an end. The Mashiach will speak peace to the nations. I want to bring up one other point. I want to just raise this. There's something that could be missed. I raised earlier the very interesting contradiction between Matthew 21 with Luke chapter 19, verse 29 through 35. Just put them side by side. Just look at them side by side. You'll see Luke has Jesus coming in on one cult. In Matthew, it's two animals. In Matthew, Jesus sitting on them, if they put a cloth on them. And in Luke, it's it, one animal. If you don't see this, what am I going to say to you? It's, if you now, at first glance, you maybe are thinking to yourself, wow, what a crazy contradiction. And could you only imagine Jesus, is, I mean, that's what they do in the circus. In the circus, I remember as a little boy, when my family we used to go to the circus together, so you'd see someone who was able to stand on one foot on each horse and ride around, that was a very big deal. No one rides, that's not normal, no one rides on two animals. Matthew created a story because he misread the passage in Zechariah 9.9. And what, I'm, what I'd like you to think about is the following. Although the contradictions, whether we're looking at Mark 11.7, Luke 19, Matthew 21, and John 12.14, although the, that contradiction, as Matthew stands apart from the other three, because Matthew, very frankly, as many of you know, gets it wrong when quoting Jewish scriptures. In this case, he tried to be... He tried to be smart, and he corrected Mark, which he does a lot. In this case, he... he exposed himself. So the, I think that the first reaction to this, of course, if a person's a Christian, it's very shocking. I think any reasonable Christian has to examine this and go, um, this needs an answer. It really is difficult because how do, how do you respond to this? It's very clear. You can read Matthew 21, 1 through 7. Uh, it's very clear that there are two animals here. So the first thing is, and those who are not Christians, those who who don't like Christianity, will go, "Ha ha! Look how stupid Matthew is." Okay, that is that is probably the knee jerk reaction of how to deal with this. 
what I would like, what I'm asking you to do is actually to look at this differently and to look at something that I think is much more valuable. We can see from this contradiction how the stories were made, how they were forged, how they were shaped, how the, the prophecy was historized. Meaning, it's very clear that when the gospel writers were telling a story that Jesus did, in this case riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, in the triumphal entry, that's what it's called, what they did was they looked at a passage in the Jewish scriptures, a messianic passage, which it is, and they said to themselves, surely we can have a story with this plot device where we have our Messiah, Jesus, coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. We could say he did it. We're writing 50, 40 years after the fact. You could write whatever you want. Almost everyone's dead. Who could check out someone on a donkey? What's the big deal riding on a donkey? The, and the key is that Matthew then goes, no, I'm looking at the text, and I see here two animals. So I'm going to rewrite the story. What I'd like you to consider is that the most important takeaway of the contradiction is not that Matthew contradicts the other gospel writers. What I'd like you to consider is this reveals, this, gives, this uncovers, removes the veil of these very powerful stories and images in the Christian Bible, but this reveals how it was done. It wasn't people recording what they observed. It was rather going to the Jewish scriptures, coming up with texts that Jesus could possibly do, and then writing the story around it. Mark would do it, and, and Luke and John would follow it. Matthew would adjust it based on his reading of the text, which is a misreading of the text, because Matthew's knowledge of the Hebrew was very, very limited. And that's the key point. But most importantly, I say this, I, please, I hope I don't offend Christians. And I want to say this to those who are not Christians, please don't mock Christians. Most of them are I'm not, look, I'm not patronizing anybody. I'm not patronizing Christians. But most of them are very good people. And this is what they're raised with. This is, their, this is how they go to bed at night when they were kids. Jesus loves you. That's how they go to sleep at night. They don't they don't know any better. They really haven't examined this. What Christians don't read is Zechariah 9.10. Why? Because the Gospels won't quote it. Why? Because Jesus didn't accomplish it. There wasn't peace in the world. He didn't uh, change the world for the better. The world is for the worse. He didn't accomplish any of these things. The chariots of, were not cut off. The horses of war were not, were not removed. The bow of war was not cut off, and, and the uh, reign of the Mashiach was not from one end of the world to the other, as is, is foretold in Zechariah, not in chapter 9, but just a few chapters later in chapter 14. That on that day, he will be king of the whole world, he will be one, and his name will be one. And that's the prophecy. And if I encourage the viewers of the show. Please read Zechariah 9, verse 9 and 10. See that verse 10 begins with the word and, which means it's a continuation. And ask yourself, why doesn't the Christian Bible quote verse 10? How come no Christian knows verse 10? The answer is because Jesus didn't do it, so therefore it was jettisoned. That's what occurred. And it should be that if people will study these texts and understand what's coming, what is ahead of us, the, the coming of the true redemption of the world, it will bring the coming of Mashiach, and we should only witness it quickly in our time. Thank you for that question. אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא ואת נעשה בחפצו כל אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו, ימלוך נורא, והוא היה 